Good afternoon. My name is Monica Garcia, and I'm a Master of Public Health student in Healthcare Management and Policy at the Harvard School of Public Health. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today Dr. Donald Berwick, the former president and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, an organization that Dr. Berwick co-founded and led for 18 years. He is one of the nation's leading authorities on healthcare quality and improvement. In July 2010, President Barack Obama appointed Dr. Berwick to the position of Administrator for, of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, which he held until December 2011. A pediatrician by background, Dr. Berwick has served as Clinical Professor of Pediatrics and Healthcare Policy at the Harvard Medical School, Professor of Health Policy and Management here at the Harvard School of Public Health, and as member of the staffs of Boston Children's Hospital Medical Center, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has also served as Vice Chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the first independent member of the Board of Trustees of the American Hospital Association, and Chair of the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. An elected member of the Institute of Medicine, IOM, Dr. Berwick, served two terms on the IOM's Governing Council and was a member of the IOM's Global Health Board. What a phenomenal leader. He served on President Clinton's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection Quality in the Healthcare Industry. Dr. Berwick is the author and co-author of over 160 scientific articles and four books. At present, he is a lecturer in the, in the Department of Healthcare Policy at the Harvard Medical School and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. I will now turn the program over to Professor John McDonough, but before I do, please join me in welcoming Dr. Donald Berwick. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here and being part of this conversation. It's an honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Berwick to the Harvard School of Public Health. And we already had a great introduction. But I find that a lot of people don't fully understand the particular role that you played in the development of modern medical care. So I have just four questions I want to ask, one from each of the prior four decades. and. <laughs> Then we're going to turn it over to the audience. But I, I want to start back in the 1980s when you were a pediatrician at the Kenmore Center at the Harvard Community Health Plan. And you were given the assignment of being in charge of quality assurance for the plan. And you had the temerity to wonder, what do organizations outside medical care do about quality? And you discovered the field of total quality management and quality improvement, which was revolutionizing American industry and manufacturing. And you had the insight to wonder if those techniques and tools and approaches could be applicable to healthcare. And with that, you pioneered the development of what's now called continuous quality improvement. You started the National Demonstration Project on Quality Improvement in Healthcare, which turned into the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. You wrote a seminal article for the New England Journal of Medicine in 1989 called Continuous Improvement as an Ideal in Healthcare. I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on that era, that time, when you were the radical, the person trying to create a revolution, and what that period was like and how you look back on it now. Thanks, John. And, uh Thanks, Monica, for that introduction, and Betty, for all the work you've done to have me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, back home, I guess. Um, well, uh, I, the ground had been laid for me for the work you're talking about by my training, my education. I'd been a medical student at Harvard, but I also was in the second ever class for the Master's of Public Policy program at, Harvard, at the Kennedy School, so I had a joint degree. And I was learning my medicine in, in the medical school, but at the Kennedy School was full of analytic methods and political science, economics, operations research, decision theory, things that gave me, gave me new glasses to watch work as I was be, being a doctor. That's why I was uh, asked to come to the Harvard plan to see patients, but also to have oversight of quality. But it gave me the, that had given me the tools to study quality, and it was really frustrating. The, um, the, everything we measured, and I had a 
a very large budget to measure quality because the leadership were worried about whether the cost constraints were hurting patients. They didn't want that to happen, so they needed a scientist to come in to watch. That was my job. All of the metrics were steady so that they were like okay, but not better. So uh, ranging from you know complications at birth to waiting times to uh, 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 complications of surgery, and uh, and the culture of of quality was not didn't feel right. So I would tell the staff like what the satisfaction levels are, what the complications rates are, and they just got angry. I mean, they were just really <laughs> annoyed that somebody was insulting them. Uh, with metrics, because uh, they were doing the very best they could. And I knew they did it. I was one of them. I saw patients there, and I, I suffering from the same frustrations they were, and it didn't seem right. And then just a series of accidents, I got introduced to Dr. Deming, W. Edwards Deming, one of, he was the great icon in industry for improvement, and I started to get the idea that we didn't have to be stuck. It wasn't necessary that performance be stable but that we must be using the wrong way to change it. That was my, that was, it was just frustration. I did not intend to be a revolutionary. It wasn't like a plot. <laughs> I was, it was just curiosity and, and then friendship because there were people around the country about the same level. I made a bunch of calls around the country. I called NASA because they, I know they'd gotten to the moon and that seemed interesting. <laughs> uh, and um, the NASA thing was probably the turning point because I called NASA and the out of the cold and the guy that answered the phone was the head of quality for NASA. And, and I told him what, what was up. I said, you got to the moon, we're not. Could you help? <laughs> and uh, he said, I'll, com I'll come up tomorrow. And he flew up from, from, uh, from Washington and spent four hours with me with overhead transparencies. You don't know what those are, but that used to be the rule. <laughs> and he described the quality system at NASA. And John, it was unbelievable. I saw, I saw what improvement could be if leadership took it seriously. You had methods to use, and you regarded improvement as the job instead of stability as a job. And that was one of a series of encounters, uh, and it was just wonderful. I just was t blown away, and luckily had some friends around the country, and we decided to try the demonstration project, which was an experiment to combine people like the guy from NASA with people in healthcare to work together, and it ended up four, four years to try to make improvements. That was the beginning of all this, this change. The article was the time I wrote down what I'd learned, and that was Howard Hyatt, former dean here. He came to my office, and I told him what I was discovering. He said, you ought to write that, so I did. And that's where that article came from. It was never a plan to revolutionize anything. It was, it was like frustration and then curiosity. Mm -hmm. Is that an answer? And what was the reaction from the medical community in the early days, aside from your <laughs> own plan? It was well, uh, two. There was a mainstream reaction, and then the 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 fringe reaction. The mainstream reaction, well, like in nineteen, I remember nineteen eighty five. Uh, I was um, I was already into this, and uh, I was asked to meet with a group of orthopedic surgeons, and. Uh, they wanted to start a quality assurance committee, and they'd known I'd done that at the Harvard plan. So they said, uh, what should we do? So I went and spoke to them. I said, okay, first idea is let's not call it a quality insurance committee. Let's call it a quality improvement committee. And I remember a surgeon stood up, a nice guy, and he said, we can't really do that because that would make people think we're not doing, we're, we're doing something wrong now. <laughs> it, it was this kind of, you know, we're okay. You know, let's just tighten this, tighten the, the screws a bit, but no sense that there was a fundamental change needed. On the other hand, there were people who were just as excited as I was about the new methods of improvement, and they became instant friends. And, and I learned that I, I was working with maybe, I don't know, one out of 10 or one out of eight of my colleagues, and they wanted to make the changes, and they were interested, and that's how it all began with a, with a, small, a smaller group. But that's all you really need. Mm -hmm. So you didn't see it as a revolution, but it was because it was a fundamental shift which happened, I observed with remarkable rapidity, from the paradigm of quality assurance to the paradigm of quality improvement. And you turned IHI into a laboratory of tools and methods to equip people to be able to do that work. Right. But in the mid-1990s, someone showed up at your office named Tom Nolan, right. quality improvement expert, who kind of had the temerity because you were already pretty prestigious by the mid-90s to tell you that you were missing the point. Right. The point was not the tools, 
the point was, what were you trying to accomplish? What was the aim? What was the higher goal? And that led to a whole different phase of your leadership in American medicine. I wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah, Tom was a great gift for Maine. one of my, my the most admired colleagues. I think he's probably taught me more than almost anybody else, except you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, you're exactly told it right. So if you taught me in 1989, 1991, and I, and I said, well, we really need new, I said, we need new tools. We need like different kinds of measurement, control charts. We need to use diagnostic tools to understand processes. We need to think in process terms, draw processes. I was tools oriented. And that's actually how, if you enter the field, you'll discover uh, there, there are manuals of improvement. What I didn't understand were two things that Tom picked up on when he began to come to our meetings in about 1994, 93. One was that this, the tools are they're just like in a toolkit. You need leadership and a transformative view of leadership. And, and if you weren't going to reorganize around improvement as a systemic issue, strategic, governance level, linked to the business model, you know, the, it, it's, it's not like adding on a tool. It's a different way to think about, about what you do. And everybody knows that. I mean, the, you know, when I teach it, I, you, everybody in this room has experienced this because there are some parts of your life that you're just trying to hold stable, you know, get back and forth to work. And there are other parts of your life that you really want to make get better at, your chess game, your tennis, or your, 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 your marriage. And, and you, you do something different. When you're interested in improvement, it's a different enterprise than just getting through the day. That's, that's number one. Number two was subject matter, and this is where I really blew it at first. Uh, Tom noticed when we were studying improvement, we were all about the methods and the tools and the statistics and the science, which is all beautiful, but we weren't doing anything. We weren't on the ground changing things in the real world. And this connection to subject matter, to patients, w w had to happen. Learning methods wasn't enough. And that's where the Breakthrough Series came from. That was invented at IHI it was by my colleague Paul Batalden. But we were sitting together one day and saying, why don't we form consortia of hospitals, pick a topic. The first one we picked was cesarean section rates. The next one was uh, cardiac surgery outcomes, and we're going to work on the topic using the tools. And that shift of focus to actually results for patients, that, that, was, the, that was key turning point. We still were yet to confront the leadership and governance issue. That came later, and that also became thematically crucial. And one of the manifestations of that different approach was something in the latter part of the last decade called the Triple Aim. Yes. I was recently in Britain and in South Africa and in both countries, I hear people talking about the triple aim. Can you talk about where that came from yeah. and what that was about and I can. What's, what's the story behind it? it, it there's actually a little sub-story there, which is uh, I, I, I'm old enough and have been through this enough that I kind of can trace these things to their roots and I know where that came from, I know the day it arrived. And it sometimes <laughs> troubles me, I, I can't maintain the pedigree of it because I know it was John uh, Whittington and Tom Nolan were in a meeting and they invented this term and then they and what is the triple aim? The triple aim, what they were saying Sorry. is, okay, it's okay to work on improvement, let's say, of, of a healthcare outcome, let's say, reduce pressure ulcers or reduce surgical infections. But, you know, that's not really the point. You know, we want to be healthy, and, and if we keep using healthcare to get to health, we're kind of missing the point, as you know, in this school. Only 10% of variance in health, care, health is due to healthcare, 50% is genetic, but 40% is environment violence in society, nutrition, exercise, you know that. So they said, we really have to work on health, and that's an additional aim. Health care, health. But meanwhile, check the newspaper. We're using too much resources to do that because schools are suffering, roads are suffering, museums can't get support. Health care is not entitled to all the money it can get. It's entitled to enough to do its work well. So they said there's really three goals. Better health care, if you're sick, that's where I was working, better health, upstream and then lower cost. And they, the triple aim united those three in a single network of aims, which are technically not in competition with each other. That is, it's easy to think, oh, lower cost means worse care, but that's not true. If you think about improvement, it's just part of the game, better care at lower cost. That became that idea, better care, better health, lower cost, that's the triple aim. And it, it took off like wildfire. I wrote the article, they generously let me be co-author in health affairs in, I can't remember the you probably know, 20, 2002, 2003. But it just swept the world. I was in Portugal last week, and they're organizing the port redesign of Portuguese healthcare around the Triple Aim. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. the, what's happening there, John? Just so mm -hmm. I can say, is that the key idea there is to regard cost 
as a quality. And that sounds sort of zen, but it isn't. It's that the, the, the cost of production, the cost of getting your thing done is a quality, just like the error rate is or the satisfaction level is. And when you think that way, you can put it all together and, and, and get a really unified view of excellence. Mm -hmm. So you had the opportunity to not just advance that as an idea and a concept, mm -hmm. but you had the opportunity to really put your money where your mouth is when you accepted the assignment to lead the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services over 18 months in 2010, right after the passage of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And you were, from being a uniter and a voice for all of medical care, you were in an agency and you were part of the Democratic administration of President Obama and you were vilified by the Republican side who referred to you as Dr. Rationing because of your work with the British National Health Service. Can you, but you did also have the opportunity to do things like really try to bring the triple aim into that place, the biggest bureaucracy in the federal government. Can you talk about um, what that experience was like, the good, the bad, the ugly, what you took from it, what you learned, and what, what you hold on to that was most important from that experience now? Came out of the blue. I did not expect to be asked. Uh, phone rang day after Christmas, and it was Senator Tom Daschle at that time who thought he'd be HHS secretary. He asked me to run CMS. I said no. Uh, <laughs> you know, I thought I, did, I, I said to him, you know, <clears throat> Senator, uh, I can't run CMS. You know, I'm a pediatrician. I run a small nonprofit. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Don, I don't want you to run CMS. I want you to change CMS. That was the kind of really interesting thing I started to think about. And then the new law came, so it just was not something I felt I could walk away from. I felt so lucky to get the chance, and uh, I still feel that it was an amazing, amazing part of my life. I went to D.C. in July of 2010, and it became, well, you know, you were there. It was, um, it's a schizophrenic existence. Part of it is rough. It's, it's, there's a vituperation, mischaracterization, this doctor rationing thing is just dumb. I mean, it's nothing to do with what I think or believe, and that wasn't the worst of it. Uh, so part of it was, it was interesting. I mean, it was like going anthropologically interesting. Um, <laughs> It kind of rolled off my back, though, because the other part was so good. I mean, I got to be part of the administration implementing the most important uh, health care law of, uh, since 1965, changing the whole profile of justice in America, mm -hmm. making health care a human right or taking a step in that direction. And I got to use what I've been telling you about improvement in that arena, and I, that was my intent. It was amazing. I loved it. And... Um, very hard. I mean, these were 18-hour days, and uh, phone never off, uh, and constantly challenging because I had to learn stuff I didn't know. I didn't know how to write a regulation, or I didn't know how to deal with office of management and budget, or or uh, the Administrative Procedures Act. You know, this is all new to me, but that was the best part of it because I was constantly getting educated, and there, everyone was so generous. The staff were. Everyone said, "Oh, big bureaucracy. You know, why would you want to go there? These are." People just watching the clock, you know, nah. They were 5,000 dedicated civil servants, and they wanted me to be successful, and I wanted them to be. So it was, it was fantastic. I loved it. Mm -hmm. and, um, are, there any, are there any particular things you feel like you were able to get done that you hold on to that you're particularly proud of from that experience? It's hard to say the time. It, it, we, it'll ask me in a few years, and we can look back on it, because I don't know what sticks and what doesn't. I mean, I knew from day one that I wasn't going to change Mitch McConnell's mind. or uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, I could meet with him, but he was not, it wasn't a real conversation. Mm -hmm. Nor, by the way, could I affect the White House too much. You know, the President Obama had put his stamp on this law. They cared a lot about it, and I was taking direction from the White House, because it was the, the President says, I'm going to do this, you salute. I mean, it's... <laughs> So my focus was on excellence internally, and what I began working on was the culture and the capacity of, of the agency, because it was going to survive us all. And if it couldn't work well, the healthcare system wouldn't. I told uh, the day three, I had an all-staff meeting, all 5,000 people, because you can do that there. They have very good um, remote uh, broadcast capacity. And I said, uh, I introduced them to my family. I showed pictures of my kids, and then I said, we were going to, that the, the Gandhi quote, you have to be the change you wish to see in the world, you all heard that. So that's what I said, that you got to stop and think. Now we want healthcare to be responsive, patient-centered, not waste money, be agile, 
uh, everything we want healthcare to be, we're going to do. And one thing you want healthcare to be is one team. You don't want your surgeon and your doctor to touch other. So we're one team. And I just tried to begin to use that idea of transformative uh, behaviors in the agency as something I expected and wanted and wanted to support. And that, that's what I'm proudest of. I think that people wanted that. They really did take to it. To make it durable, I had to be able to find people to bring into the agency who understood that, and that was hard. But I recruited some really great people who are still there, and I, hopefully they're carrying that on. One of the knocks on you when you were there by many of the Republicans in Congress was your work w consulting with the British National Health Service. And for that, you got knighted by the Queen of England. I've always wanted to ask you, what is it like to get knighted by the Queen of England? <laughs> What happens? <laughs> How does your life change? <laughs> Can any of us get it? <laughs> well, you call your wife. Uh, it was funny. They called the, the, the consul general in the Boston said, they, they don't just knight you. They ask you, here's how it goes. Say, you know, Dr. Burke, if the queen were to offer you a knighthood, would you accept it? Because they want to kind of clear the way. Uh, first, it would be insulting. So I said, yes, I would. So that was the beginning. Uh, if for non-British citizens, the actual procedure is not done by the Queen. It's done by the ambassador of the country you're in. So I went to, uh, that would happen for me in the um, British Embassy in DC. And it was, there's a signed parchment thing and a seal. And they, these guys in uniform walk out and hand it to you, put it around your neck. And uh, then you get the night manual. There's a manual. <laughs> uh, and I know it's on the first page, but I've got to tell you this. One, it says privilege of knighthood. One is if you commit a capital crime, unlike commoners who are always hanged, you can get to choose. You can be hanged or beheaded. <laughs> I noticed that was one of the privileges. But it was actually, it was an amazing experience. And I, I feel so uh, grateful for it and honored by it. But, and I know what happened was IHI got invited to go to the UK in the late 90s as Tony Blair came in to try to change care there. And it was a whole team of people. And it's a little embarrassing because there were probably 10 people who were in the UK through that decade helping make the changes that, that this recognition was for. Mm -hmm. So last question, and then we're going to open it up. So thinking about this decade and what's ahead for you, the Boston Globe reports that you're now getting ready to run for governor of Massachusetts. Can you talk about your decision process and what you see and what that's about? I haven't finally decided, but I'm deep into it. I'm very, very serious about considering it. Um, it's a choice. I mean, I, in DC, I was so <clears throat> amazed by what government can do when it's doing it well. You know, I could see really good things happen to people. I, as, as administrator, I really got to shape regulations, let's say, and I could tell you that there are hundreds of thousands of people who are being affected by, by what I got to do and think. My brother gave me a, a plaque when I went there for my desk. My brother's a retired school teacher, and the plaque said, uh, how would it help the patient? And I put that on my desk, and that, that's all. I, uh, that's what I kept saying, how will it help the patient? So I, I was trying to keep my eye on that. And now, uh, so I can't be in, I can't be there now. The 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 Constitution. I was a, I was a recess appointee, so I would have stayed if I could, but I couldn't. And now I'm back, kind of reconfiguring the next phase of what I'm going to do. And I think, well, I think government is. If we're not going to keep government in our minds and make it work, um, lots of people are going to get hurt. I mean, government is this. It is the place where we come together to do things that we can't do otherwise, and it's the place where people get protected. That's, to me, that's, and, and the protections are going to go away if we can't make government work. In Washington, it's just not really very civil right now. So I think states are very interesting. I'd like to try. Legislature is interesting, but I, I feel like the executive role is interesting. So yes, I'm, I'm taking a really serious look at it. I'm not naive. I, it'd be hard to get and hard to do, but, uh, you know, it's a choice. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're going to open it up now for questions and comments. We need everybody to know that you're supposed to, A, identify yourself, who you are, and B, wait for the microphone. Don't start talking so that people who aren't in this room can hear your questions. So who wants to jump up first? Good afternoon. My name is Maya Fedison, and I'm a master's student in the Health Policy and Management Department. So as a pediatrician and a policymaker, I was wondering if you could talk about one or two child health policies that you think hold the most promise for improving the health of America's children. Thanks, Maya. Um, well, I think underneath the policy is commitment. And so I think the first 
I think the first step to me is to embrace as a commonwealth, as a community, the, the, what's behind your question is was that we want kids to be successful. And, and I, th I can't overstate how important it is to be willing to take a stand on what you value and what you're going to pursue and do it without checking the polls. And so that, that's important. Some, sometimes we're committed to kids, sometimes we forget them. With, with kids, the, 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 the thing to remember is what makes a child healthy isn't health care. Yes, they need their immunizations and their, some of their checkups, not all of them. And, and uh, uh, you know, we need to be disciplined when they get sick. But no, you know, the, the kid with asthma that I used to take care of who was having recurrent attacks was having attacks because of no heat in their apartment or because uh, the parents were distracted or poor, couldn't get the meds the kid needed or hadn't been educated or uh, some other stress, violence in, in society. You can't ask a kid to be healthy and exercise if, if, if they're, they can't be safe on their own front porch, let alone running through the street. So we, we, you, kids are about this, this is the nature of society as a whole, and I think that's the kind of commitment we need. It's about you know, really, really healthy communities. We're underinvested there, as you know. You know the, that's one of the reasons why the healthcare reform is so key. Healthcare is taking into the technocratic end of healthcare, which is miraculous and we should keep it, but it's taking much too much, so we, and we're not able to put the resources back into the, kid, the thing that will affect the kids in the future, nutrition, jobs for their parents, um, a safe environment, and, and, and healthy, clean air and water. Um, I, was, I had this amazing experience last, two weeks ago. I was in uh, Palm Springs where President Clinton was hosting the Clinton Health Matters Initiative, which is a new initiative on the Clinton Foundation organized around health at the community level. And I remember this moment where the chief, the superintendent of schools, from the county that Palm Springs is in, which is, although Palm Springs is very wealthy, the county's not, said that he had just managed to get uh, 12,000 iPads. Every kid in the school, every kid in the school now has an iPad. And he turned to this 350 people, all interested in health, said, what can I do with this now? You know, how can I use this to make kids healthy? I thought, oh my gosh, what an amazing question. Wouldn't you like to just turn everybody loose and help health occur through that kind of mechanism and it's not happening in a hospital? Mm -hmm. Who's next? Thank you for your presentation. And my name is Maureen Miller. I'm a Master's of Public Health student in Occupational and Environmental Health. But um, more often, before coming here, I was a medical student at NYU. And there's a lot of controversy at NYU and the other New York hospitals now about um, the Health and Hospitals Corporation in New York City trying to implement a pay for performance program uh, based in part on this idea of, of quality improvement. So. Um, I guess in thinking about that, I know Daniel Ofri, a doctor at Bellevue, has written about a lot of the Hurricane Sandy problems with maintaining quality initiatives in the, the shortages of the public system, like not even having computers, really not having records of ER waiting time. So um, I guess I was just wondering if you had any comments on that. More comments with the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's Thanks, the gist. Uh -huh. NYU is my, my father was a doctor. He's in NYU, was an NYU um, alumnus. Um, <laughs> pay for performance is all the rage right now, and you can see the logic behind it. It's like if you're, if healthcare is varying in its performance among the hospitals in New York, what is it, does it really make sense that you, every, you get paid, the hospital gets paid, or everyone gets paid no matter how well they're doing? That doesn't sound, it sounds something's wrong with that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the next logical thing is to say, well, you know, if you do better, you get paid more. If you do less, you, you get paid less. And that should alert boards of trustees and leaders and everybody to, to work harder or do it right. You know, I can't basically disagree with that. And in implementing the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot of that stuff in it. And it does wake up boards and leaders when they notice some money's flowing a different way if they don't get complications down. I think the reaction you're hearing, though, is about the, it's about the more sophisticated understanding of, of system performance. It's not just about what you get paid. That's carrot and stick thinking. That's black box thinking, is are the resources and the supports and the culture available that allow people to do the work they really want to do? And I, I guess I would say let's probably pay more for excellence and less for, for, for uh, getting things wrong. But don't confuse yourself. That's not what actually makes things better. It's a dynamic, a continual, continual improvement, which is all about learning. That's hard. It was hard in government. When I made that argument at OMB, for example, when we launched uh, the, uh, I got to help launch the 
Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, which is $10 billion that Congress has set aside for support, the, that kind of support, support to learning and growth. And then it's a, and that can be translated right into regulations, amazing part of the law. And I set that center up with my colleagues and uh, it started to issue its RFPs and you know, got the programs going, they're good. But I, I put something in that, in the implementation, I said I want 5,000 innovation fellows throughout the United States. The center will fund not just the demonstration, but the human resource that allows the demonstration to be learned from. Couldn't sell it to OMB. I couldn't sell it to the people who were counting the, because it's, it's, a, it's a rather more cultural idea and it's hard to score it. Now they eventually improved 70 and we got them going amazing success. We had 80, 800 applications for those 70 slots and we could have 5,000 tomorrow, we should, but it's really hard to get out of carrot and stick thinking and into developmental thinking, which is a leadership challenge. <clears throat> Thank you. That ties in well to my question. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, my name is Amy Grace. I'm a Master of Public Health student in Health Policy and Management. I agree with you that government can be a very powerful uh, force for change when used for good. Um, I was at the Harvard Social Enterprise Conference last weekend, and there were some groups doing some great innovation in the healthcare sector, um, in the private uh, sector. They were concerned that due to some of the bureaucracy with Medicare and Medicaid, that they were having trouble pursuing their innovations. And I was just wondering, it kind of ties into the CMMI, but what um, do you see going forward in terms of innovating in the private sector and how that can relate to Medicare and Medicaid? Thank you. That's a, it's, it's really important. Uh, one of the things I learned in DC, I sort of knew it vaguely from my background, but I never saw it that sharply in, in focus as I did at, at CMS, was we, the, the concept of partnership between government and the private sector, it's not a vague idea, it's a real idea. And, and, and you can get it right and you can get it wrong. It's, it's dyadic, both the parties have to play well with others, but it, it, when it's correctly intended that the private sector and the government are gonna work well together, and then people are behaving in ways that build that kind of trust. It's a much more healthy environment than a regulatory, you know, we're controlling you and we're, we're resisting control. And I could see that happen. I'll give you an example. When I arrived there, I heard this, you know, CMS has a lot of inspection apparatus. We have survey and certification routines and quality improvement organizations. A lot of inspections go on. And I guess you need them, that's quality assurance, and you need that, but it, I knew that we were adding cost and waste to the system we just didn't know how. So I went to uh, the associations, the American Hospital Association, the Joint Commission, the AMA, especially the AHA. I said, how do we make your life harder? You, what, what are the things that we're doing that don't make any sense to you, assuming that we both want high quality care? And, and, and so they took it seriously. And I got back a very detailed analysis of things that didn't make sense. From the Joint Commission, I got a list of about 80 things that didn't make sense, I remember. And I took them to my staff and I said, what doesn't make sense here? What do you agree with? They agree with everything, almost everything. They said, why do we do that? Or, or they explained there was this reg in the distant past when you know, doctors rode horses that, that you know, <laughs> and we really, some of these were like ancient regs that made sense in the pre-internet era. Um, at that point, the president issued, luckily, an executive order on ordering simplification of regulations. It, it came out shortly after I arrived, totally fortuitous. So I said, we're gonna be the lead agency here, and we were. And we, we ended up with a reg uh, uh, that had, a, it, it, it took a billion dollars of waste out. It was only the beginning. I think if you do it right, that kind of partnership is possible. You have to keep aware there are bad guys out there and you don't want to be naive, but to treat everybody like a bad guy, not, not a good idea. And, and that kind of partnership I think is, is crucial. Hi, I'm Tari. I'm in the health policy program here as well. I was curious if you could speak to the skills beyond the analytic skills that you mentioned that could help students now focus on quality improvement. I'll give you a technical answer then, a less technical one. There's a very wonderful framework. Remember I mentioned W. Edwards Deming? These, there, are, there are like, I don't know, five or six scholars of the 20th century who develop what most industries would, would regard as the modern scientific foundations for rapid improvement of complex systems. That's the basic theory. Some of them you've met, some of them you, you've never heard of, and I don't know if you know Deming's work. He's, he was pretty good at this, and he, uh, he invented a lot of ideas. But in his later years, he came up with a four-part uh, analysis of what he thought the skill base was for effective leadership of improvement. And uh, he, he, uh, unfortunately, he called it profound knowledge, the worst <laughs> title I've ever heard, but, but the elements are worth studying. And here's, here, just 
technically here what he said systems understand systems interdependencies it, it's not parts that make a difference it's interactions and understanding those interactions all the way from just being able to know they're there to the technical aspects of nonlinearity that's one the second he called uh, psychology which means it's a set of uh, topics around how we deal with each other teamwork conflict resolution adult learning processes group processes those all matter and they're worth studying and you can get better at it and embedded in that is motivation understanding a much more sophisticated theory of motivation than just contingent reward which is what you were talking about it's it, it's it's not very complete it doesn't explain my motivation the third area was uh, epist was um, uh, uh, epistemology how do you how do you learn uh, learning in in your life you generally accomplish through serial processes of trying stuff you know, the souffle wasn't right this time so I'll cook it at a different temperature next time that's called plan do study act in the jargon that's that's how you learn in real time which is different from a formal experiment and the last area is statistics but different from the biostatistics you're learning here if you were to visit any effective company today that's really improving fast they're using real-time measurements and learning from variation in a, in a different way from a formal experimentalist. So that's the technical answer. I'll tell you the real answer, and that's values, that I am now persuaded, taught by my successor and my former deputy at IHI, Maureen Bizignano, who you should have in this program. She's an amazing, best leader I've ever seen. Maureen believes, what I now believe, is that it all starts with values. If you can articulate the value structure through which we're going to work together, you're more likely to get a good result. And then you support people to act on those values. At CMS, I brought five values. I, I, this is, again, that same first speech. Boundarylessness, which means we're going to tear down all the walls. We're all in this together. Speed and agility. The world changes fast. You've got to change at least as fast as the world does. Unconditional teamwork, which is share. Just share. You know, what you have, give it away. And that means you'll get. Um, the fourth value was innovation, which is it's, life is fun only is most fun when you're trying something different tomorrow. Let's try something different. And then the fifth value was customer focus, which is you serve somebody, go ask them how you're doing, and listen. Those five values became the core of my strategy plan at CMS, and, and they, it, I couldn't have done anything without them. So that's, I don't know if you hear that in your education, but believe me, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Cohn, I'm a cardiac surgeon at a nearby uh, community hospital called the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's a local community place. You may know it. Anyway, I, uh, I really enjoyed your remarks and I followed your career and your writings with great interest. Really tremendously helpful. I have a question related to funding of the highest and most expensive things in our medical uh, hemisphere or our medical galaxy. And I always wondered why, when the new rules came down, Mr. Obama and yourself, perhaps, did invite all the leaders of cardiology, cardiac surgery, or of orthopedics. The highest, most expensive items in the galaxy of medical care to say, what should we pay for and what should we not pay for? Because as you know better than anybody, there's a huge variation state to state on various procedures. For example, if you look at stents in coronary arteries, there's a huge variation in Ohio than there is in Florida. And why didn't we have national standards of reasonableness and accuracy in conjunction with the leaders of the great organizations that uh, sort of lead these two areas rather than just say, well, you can do anything you want. I mean, i give you an example. Uh, two years ago, I operated on a, on a man that came in with angina. He had had 10 stents put in the same artery. Now, what was the reason that was being done? I think it was mostly for economic improvement of the stentologist. Uh, but that, that didn't deserve to be paid. I'm just wondering, is there many, and somebody said when I asked this question before, well, we had the AMA in there, but the, as you well know, the AMA does not represent the heart and soul of these high spending specialties. And I just wondered if that was ever given consideration or might it be given consideration? Thanks, Dr. Cohen. It's an honor to have you here. You, you saved the life of a friend of mine, and I, I'm in your debt. Um, the, uh, to, let's see it from the inside in Washington. Uh, all day long in my office, there's a parade of people coming in. 
sometimes it's people from the White House or the Congress saying, there's no more money, figure out how to save money. And then the other half of the day, there's everybody else coming in asking for more money. And, and it, because they, you know, $800 billion being spent, uh, rules of payment being spent, and there's this game underway, which is pay me more, pay me more. I learned that these people, the lobbyists, I didn't think they were bad guys in general. They, they were proud of what they did, and they believed in what they did, and they wanted to be more valued. And, and so it was, you know, it was kind of logical, but it doesn't work. When everybody's coming in saying more, 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 what happens on the, on the government side is everybody goes, oh, you know, okay, they're going to ask for more. And, and it becomes this, it's not a real dialogue. It's not the kind of conversation you want. And you'd do it too if you were there, because you've got to have a way to deal with this kind of overwhelming request for excess. And I think that starts us off on the wrong foot, because then it's hard to say, you know, let's have the cardiac surgeons come in and talk to them about exactly how they should get paid, exactly what they should be paid for. I'd be laughed out of the, laughed out of the White House. They would say, what are you talking about? These are the same people who are just telling us to raise their fees. Um, some form of authenticity is missing. And I think the causes are too complicated for the time we have in a meeting like this. I think it has to do with fee-for-service payment. I think we got into a payment scheme that makes no sense. We're paying for inputs. It'd be like buying your car, paying for the door handle and the carburetor, and uh, instead of saying, no, I want transportation. That's what I really want to buy. We don't buy the, what we're after. And so we force the delivery systems into thinking about the next widget and the next device, and we, so we get what we pay for. Another is habits of cynicism, which have seeped into this dialogue, and, and now our, even our leaders are, are acting as if authentic conversation isn't possible. We're, we've got a big problem here. And then you start to tamper with it. You say, well, let's take a look, for example, at the resource-based relative value scale, which was developed here by Bill Shaw. Fabulous progress. Probably time to end it. You know, it, it, it it's it's input-based payment. Great accomplishment. What's next? You try to tamper with that, and you will have your phone ring off the hook from the current stakeholders in that payment scheme. So you, you, the, the easiest choice is don't, don't tamper with it. Don't tamper with it. Is progress possible? I think it really is. I think it's going to have to be dyadic. And I, some of your questions that you sent me in advance, I wanted to acknowledge it. How to be a leader in this field? We've got to unite what Dr. Cohn's talking about, the subject matter, and the good heart of the profession, the idea that we want to help people, and we need the resources to do it, with the people that have some of the controls in government and the private sector, and begin really serious conversations. What the, what the professions have to ante up is the triple aim. If, if, the, if the doctors of the United States came forward and said, we will deliver better care, better health, and lower costs starting tomorrow, we are going to figure this out because we know how to improve, and we're going to work at it, we understand society needs to do it, they'd have, they'd have the high ground right away. When the, when, the, when the Affordable Care Act was signed, it included the creation of this entity called Accountable Care Organizations, and many critics said, we've never seen one in real life. Mm -hmm. Now we have over 250 that have been approved by CMS and more than 300 working beyond the Medicare population. How do you see that going? I see the Accountable, accountable Care Organizations to me are a one of a family on the arc uh, of different animals, you know, and, and with the arc is going toward integrated care, that we really need a way to create journeys of care, because most of the costs and most of the suffering is happening with people with chronic illness. I, I always get, forget exactly the numbers, but it's what, 5% uh, costing about 40% of the bill and 20%, 80% of the bill. So these people need more help. They need, they need, they need help to learn how to keep themselves as well as possible to avoid complications, to keep their medications in order, to integrate health into their lives. We don't do it because of what we're talking about, fragmented care. So there, in the Affordable Care Act, and in, including in private sector initiatives, there's a lot of effort to create payment for journeys. Accountable Care Organization is one such effort. It's qu quite a brilliant idea, which is to kind of pay like you would an HMO, which is a kind of global budgeting or population-based payments so you could send in a home health nurse instead of building another cath suite. Um, that's good. But without denying patients choice and keeping them in a fee-for-service payment system. So it's a weird combination of ideas which would allow, if it worked, the patients would have choice, the caregivers would have the flexibility to put resources where they really matter, and everybody gains. There's savings because care gets better.
We'll see if it works. So I'd never, I'd never thought of the arc metaphor for accountable care. Does that mean there were male ACOs and female ACOs? <laughs> there are. There are four <laughs> kinds, as you know. <laughs> no, there, I'll, I'll take John's question uh, as more than a joke. One of the really neat things <laughs> about uh, about the regulation writing part, which actually I went there thinking I'd hate writing regs. It sounded very boring. It's not. It's really, really interesting, and that's a time for another lecture. But. Uh, once we were trying to write the regulation on ACOs, out of the woodwork came the heterogeneity of America. That is, places going, you know, ape over too much risk. Don't give us risk. We want to share gains. We don't share risk. We're not ready yet. We don't have our information system. Can you make an easy ACO for us? And then the other hand, we had physician groups like from Southern California saying, why be so timid? We can take all the risks now. We're ready to just take global payments and we can do, we can make symphonic music if you'll just pay us this way. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, so I said, why do we have to write one reg? Why don't we write a, an, an arc? I, know, I didn't use that. You know, let's have several different forms. And we did. We ended up with, with actually three kinds of ACOs, all the way from pioneers, which are those ready to take all the risk, to track one, which was, you know, kind of simple, you know, ACOs for ACO 101. And it happened. That's how it is. Let's keep going. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Berwick, for your service and speaking with us today. My name is John. I'm an MPH student. Um, my question to you is, uh, if you were still director of CMS, uh, which I wish that you were, um, <laughs> what would you say to uh, conservative Republican governors who are refusing Medicaid funds, um, as well as refusing to set up uh, health insurance exchanges? Um, it doesn't make sense. What they're doing doesn't make sense. They're hurting themselves and their states and their, and their hospitals and their doctors and their poor people. And I think they'll realize that. And so one of the things I would say is that I'd try to make the case that wrong war to fight right now. You know, here the federal government's putting a 100% match for three years on the table. These people are going to come to your emergency rooms anyway. Do you really want to leave the hospitals and doctors dangling out there? Or, or why not take it for now? And then we'll work out the rest of the policy later. Do you not want them to get care? And, and I think one by one you're seeing them click in. In fact, the history in the past few weeks has been governor after governor saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I think we need this. There'll be a few laggards. But, it, you know, the last state to accept Medicaid was Arizona, uh, what, how many 1981. years? 1981. 1981. 16 years. 16 years. So that'll happen <clears throat> with this. So I think there's actually something behind your question, John, it was, that I think is um, lesson learned for me. When I went there, of course, when you're in the administration at the level I was at, a high level, you're kind of on the team. you got to take instruction from the, the, the White House. And uh, I did. And they, they were saying, eh, you know, Congress is, say away, you know, right now they've got stuff to work out. I don't think that was the right call. And if I could have changed one thing with the Republican legislators, I would have gone and talked to them. I would have gone and talked to them. I think they're human beings. Yes, they're angry. I don't agree with them in political science terms. But I, I would have really tried harder to sit down and just Maybe one out of ten I actually could have begun to have a real chat with and over time. And I think that relationship building, which you saw in the old days, like Ted Kennedy famously working with Orrin Hatch, or the days of Everett Dirksen and the kind of civility um, wasn't there. So I think if you want civility, you've got to act civilly, and that would have been dialogue. You were one of the, if not the only, administrator of CMS slash Healthcare Financing Administration who was a physician. Were you the only one? Well, Mark McClellan was a Mark physician. McClellan yeah. was, right. OK. Did you, were you able to interact with the Doctors' Caucus in I, I tried. Congress? And <laughs> yeah. what was that like? The Doctors' Caucus in Congress isn't as active as it should be. I, I think it would be fabulous, even if it was partisan, even if you had Republicans and Democrats separately, to meet regularly and talk as physicians, and I'd say and nurses, because there's some nurses in Congress, to, to retouch base with their professional identity and then talk about s policy civilly and then disagree, but talk about it. But I made an effort. I reached out to Tom Price. Actually, um, several of the reps that are docs became my most frequent visitors, and they were, they were Republicans. And uh, we, didn't dis we didn't agree all the time, but we, at least we could talk with each other. Um, I, what I did in CMS, which, which uh, I realized the, the agency, and I don't know if this is true in other agencies, the professional policy-making teams, the people that write the regs and do the audits and so on, they're really good, but they don't know the subject matter. They, they're not doctors, they're not nurses, they're not pharmacists, most of them. But, but I realized, sprinkled around the, the uh, regions and the, the center was hundreds of doctors. They just never got together. So I called a meeting. I said, we're going to have a regularized 
uh, get together of all the clinical people in CMS to talk about how it's going, what your ideas are, what's the best practice in the regions, and how we're dealing with the, with the delivery system. And that, they lo that was great. They loved it. We, I only got to do it twice, but mm -hmm. I would have continued that and built that strength. I think we have time for one more question. Who wants to go ahead? Hi, my name is Audrey. I'm in the Health Policy Management Program as well. And I just have a question for you as you're looking to go more state-based and as a potential candidate for governor um, in an advanced state like Massachusetts, who's had a long history of health care reform and advancing. Um, what do you think is the next opportunity here in Massachusetts in terms of health care? In terms of health care? Health care policy. <laughs> well, my interests in, in the state are be not just health care, because I, I think the opportunity in the state is breakthrough excellence. I think that if, if there were a state where on important uh, dimensions of performance, we really just kind of broke through, it would change thinking in the country. We're so uncertain about our future and so like we don't really think we can do things that we can do. So that's the general picture. In healthcare, it's swinging the bat because what we've got now is we've got universal coverage. Healthcare is a human right in our state. We're the only state that can say that. Amazing. And now we've got a new law, thank, thanks, that's thanks largely to John, um, whose leadership has been of, of international stature in, in this realm. He's too, too, too humble to say that, but I'll say it. The, and then the cost containment law this year has got good stuff in it, because now we're kind of take, taking a hard look at reality. So we've got to figure out how to change care so we can afford it. So the, like the stage is set. What's going to happen now is resistance, because there's a lot of change that has to happen, and people aren't going to want to do that change, and leadership. There'll be some that will rise to it. And I think we need public and private leaders are going to say, no, no, that's wrong, this is right, we're going to go for the change. And, and, and that's going to be really hard. They're going to take three or four or five years of constant attention to insisting on change in delivery without harming a hair on a patient's head, and we can, we can do that. We can be successful. Betty tells me we can take one more mm -hmm. if someone has it. My name is Charlotte Gamble. Charlotte. Um, I'm a MPH student here in health policy and also a medical student from the University of Michigan. My question to you is in terms of, I appreciate your comments on values and the importance of communicating your values and establishing values and finding common values I think is something that's really important as you deal with politicians as well as healthcare and just um, building coalitions. In a very practical sense, however, I feel like sometimes people face challenges when trying to establish common values to advance policies that could be deeply rooted in values that are completely disparate. I wanted to know your specific challenges that you faced in this regard, as well as the lessons you learned about yourself and how you were able to communicate those shared values to advance policy. Thanks so much. The values I'm talking about, by the way, let me be clear, I'm not talking about ethics. I mean, don't steal, don't lie, don't kill, don't cheat, all of that. That's taken for granted. I'm talking about operating values, which, which is kind of like, if we're going to succeed, we better work together the following way. So take the value of boundarylessness, which means right now, you know, in, when I was there, Medicaid never talked to Medicare. Uh, the Office of Survey and Certification would never talk to the, you know, the, the another, you know, the QIO group. Um, and so uh, that won't work. We're in this together. And so, and that's, that's, a, that's a judgment call of a, on leadership, uh, my part as a leader saying it just won't work unless we do it. So it's not like, uh, it's not too democratic. And, and I'm not saying you're bad. If you don't want boundarylessness, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Uh, I'm just saying we have to do this to work together. Then you have to act that way. My every single day, everyone's watching me to decide, am I supportive when they do that? If they take a risk to be boundaryless, do I ding them or say, hey, look what they did. That's great. That's just what I'm after. And that constant, constant attention to modeling in my own behavior, encouraging the trials, even if they fail, that's, that's the grist of change. And, uh, and then and don't waste your time with the laggers. There'll be people that won't want to do it. They're fine. They're good people, too. But we're going to work this through. And that's, that, uh, that, that, I think, can work. So a lot of folks in here are students who are practicing physicians who are looking to move into healthcare policy. Final kind of mm -hmm. wrap up thoughts, profound insights. To share. <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to help them think they, they, you're a role model for these folks. So um, can you give them a last, uh, a last pearl of wisdom? 
well, you're already great, and I, you know, I, you don't need too much from me. I, I'd say this this conversation about values is important. I check back to see how how you want to be in your work, and then be be kind, be self conscious about that. And I, I offer you some that matter. Teamwork matters. Uh, Focusing on your customer matters. Find out who you're helping and ask them how you're doing. Have the courage to do that. Um, I think crucial in the field of healthcare right now is stay focused on patients. It's it, people and, and people who, if we don't do the right thing, will be patients. It's the need, the social need, is is your compass, and don't let the rest distract you. I guess the last is uh, remember that call from Sentinel Dash. Don't bother making a plan. You know what's the joke that. Uh, if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. Um, <laughs> most of the good stuff that's ever happened to me has been the tr plane ride I never would have anticipated sitting next to someone I never had met before, or a call out of the blue, or an opportunity, and just stay open. You know, you can't you can't program this too much. That's my experience anyway. Be open. So it's been a fascinating hour with you, and thank you for everything that you've accomplished, and good luck with everything you've got ahead of you, and thanks very much for sharing your time with the community here today. Thank, thank you. you all. Thanks, Jeff.